welcome to Community Updates. I'm Victoria Strait, and before we meet up with Emmanuel for our Zoom meeting, we're going to learn how to schedule a meeting via Zoom. So let's jump over to Screen Share, and I'll show you how to do it. So in order to schedule a meeting, we're first going to open the Zoom app that we had to download from zoom.us. Um, it will look like this when you open it. There's four different options. You can join a meeting that you have a code for, you can start a new meeting right away, you can share your screen, or you can schedule a meeting for the future. So we're going to schedule a meeting for the future for me and Emmanuel to do this episode. So we're going to call it Community Updates. We are going to be filming it on December 2nd at 10.30. That's the time we normally film is Wednesdays at 10.30. And we're just going to put this in for a couple hours because it shouldn't go that long. But you can obviously set it for longer. We're going to generate an automatically um, a meeting ID. You can do a personal meeting ID, but we don't need to. It's fine. We are going to change the password, though, because I am never going to remember this. So we're going to call it com update. And then we're going to leave the waiting room on. This just means that people can wait here before the meeting starts. Um, and that way they can just jump right into the meeting and they can be on beforehand. And then for video, we do want, I'm hosting it, so I do want my video on. And since it's only Emmanuel and I, and I want to see both of us, I am going to turn the participants video on. If you have a lot of people coming, you might not want to have everyone on video. Uh, you can turn that off if you are just doing a presentation and not everyone needs to see. So we're going to leave that on, though, just because it's me and Emmanuel. I'm going to save this to my Google Calendar because that's where I like to save it. I'm going to allow participants to join at any time. Um, you can uncheck this if you want them to only be allowed to join um, at the beginning, and if they come at a later time, they won't be able to enter. But I'm setting it for 10.30. If Emmanuel's late, I'm not going to be worried. So I'm going to let him join at any time. Um, we do not need to mute participants upon entry for this because, again, it's just me and Emmanuel. If you have a lot of people, you might want to mute participants, and then you'll be able to unmute them later. But this is just for when they enter, so not everyone's shouting hi at the same time. Um, and we are going to automatically record the meeting on the local computer, which is my computer, because I want to be able to show this video to you. But if you don't need to record the meeting, or if you're just talking with someone, you can leave that unchecked. And then we'll just hit save. We have the community updates right here um, in my calendar. And it's easy as that. So we're going to start our Zoom meeting soon, but this looks terrible. Um, when you are working with Zoom or any other webcam kind of service, um, it's important to have good lighting. Uh, it just makes you look a little bit more professional, especially like if you're doing that. And you don't want to scare your grandchildren when you're trying to say Merry Christmas. And this lighting is just awful. It's very dark in here. And then there's a little bit of light that's just like washing me out completely. So we're going to turn the light on and the overhead light. And we're going to turn on another light. Okay, so we turned on the overhead light. Um, that helps a lot. Makes me look a little bit more even, a lot less creepy. Um, I do have a desk lamp that I'm going to turn on too. And you want to make sure that you're not aiming it directly at your face because this looks horrifying. Um, you want to have it so it's facing down and bouncing kind of off the desk. It's just going to give you like a nice little glow without making you look like you're telling a ghost story to your children. So we have the Zoom app open. Um, you can see the meeting that I scheduled here the other day. Uh, this gives you what time it is now, what date it is now, and then it will tell you what the meeting is, what time it was, the meeting ID. We are just waiting for a manual. Let's go ahead and test a few things while we're here. Um, this is an option to mute myself. Um, we're going to test the speakers and microphones. 
Yes, I could hear that. Speak and pause, do you hear a replay? Speak and pause, do you hear a replay? Hit yes, and then that tells you if it looks good. If there's problems, you can kind of figure out what's going on. Um, if there's any issues, this is a better time to do it before anyone gets here instead of during the meeting because it just takes up a lot of time. So always just get to your meeting, you know, if you're hosting it, get to your meeting of, uh, a few minutes early so you can kind of test everything and make sure it's working. Hello, everyone. Thank you for checking out uh, our, this episode of Community Updates for Sterling Lancaster Community Television. This is Emmanuel. And I'm Victoria. So yeah. we're doing it a little bit different this week. We wanted to show you guys how to be using Zoom. So at the beginning of this, you have a couple um, tutorial items that I went through with you on how to set up the Zoom meeting. And now here we are. So I guess we should just jump right into updates, right? All right, let's, let's go ahead. Okay. So. For state updates, we don't have much, but um, the police stations in Massachusetts are collecting Toys for Tots. Toys for Tots has been helping families with children who might not receive toys for the holidays for over 35 years. So you can drop off unwrapped nonviolent toys for children ages infant through 14 at any of the police, state police barracks. Um, and there's even a box at the Sterling Police Barracks. Uh, so for Sterling, the residents can get Holiday Spirit sponsored by Sterling Senior Center and Sterling Council on Aging on Sunday, December 13th from noon to 1245. You can reserve your spot for a holiday festivity where you can drive through to get peppermint, cannoli, a scratch ticket, and a 2021 planner. Uh, you can call 978-422-3032 to reserve your spot for that. The Sterling Senior Center is all offering a holiday grab-and-go meal on December 23rd from 11 to 11.30 a.m. You can drive through and pick up a delicious meal of Moroccan roasted vegetable couscous soup and egg rolls. Reservations are required and you can call 978-422-3032 to reserve your meal. The Conant Public Library is holding a Parents' Night Out book club via Zoom on Monday, December 7th from 6.30 to 7.30. The book they will be discussing is Hill Women, Finding Family and a Way Forward in the Appalachian Mountains by Cassie Chambers. You can request a copy through curbside pickup Monday through Thursday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And you can email Lizzie at e-g-a-g-l-i-a-r-d-i at cwmars.org. Um, to get the link for the Zoom meeting. In Lancaster, you can see Santa at the Santa Drive-By Saturday, December 12th from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. Santa and his elves will be, at, will be on Dare Drive at the First Church Portico, handing out treats and maps to the scavenger hunt. People are asked to stay in their cars. Once you're done the scavenger hunt, you can return your map to the box on the green. A random drawing will, will determine the winner of a family-friendly prize. You ever just need to have a crazy afternoon? Well, on Thursday, December 10th, from 2 to 4 via Zoom, you can create some holiday cards. You'll need to register for the class, and you can do so by calling 978-733-4076 or emailing coaadmin at lancasterma.net. You have until December 10th to submit your house to be on the map for Light Up Lancaster. You have the chance to win bragging rights and prizes. You can submit your home to lightslancaster at gmail.com. And the full lighting dates will be on December 12th and 13th. Before we continue on with the rest of community updates, we want to show you how to share a presentation via Zoom. So whether you have a PowerPoint for work or a video for family, we'll be able to share it. So for our presentation today, we had Lex Thomas film her segment beforehand. Um, she was talking with Dominica, uh, the town planner in Sterling. So let's see what she has. So to do that, we are going to hit the button down at the bottom that says screen share, and it will bring up the sections that you can pick. We're gonna pick desktop because that's what I want to share. And now Manuel can see my desktop, right? And my dog. Yep. And we're just going to hit the interview with Lex. Thank you so much. And we have a wonderful guest this week. Now, two years ago, Sterling hired our first town planner. And this was a, a major decision for this town. And since being hired, Dominika Takashore has done 
an enormously important and complex job of moving the town planning um, project forward. And so I'm really delighted to speak with her. Dominica, lovely to see you in this Thank way. You. And you know, we've always enjoyed being in meetings together. I don't even remember the last time we actually you know, saw each other. So it's wonderful to see you in this you context. Thank you. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. And um, in the nutshell, what have these last two years been like for you? It's been extremely busy and gratifying. Um, basically, like from day one, you know, just so many projects and committees to work on, so many grants, a lot of long-term planning um, endeavors being set up, a lot of economic development um, uh, proponents that were trying to uh, set into place, a lot of long-term planning to make things happen. Sure. So a lot of these things are not really things that you see short-term, but we're setting the stage for long-term. Um, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, our special town meeting is not going to happen in December. Um, so a lot of the, the zoning changes that we're proposing are going to be pushed off to our next annual town meeting. Um, but it's all great stuff and so many grants. Um, you know, we're working on, uh, we just finished our municipal vulnerability uh, preparedness plan. Uh, we'll be also be updating our hazard, hazard mitigation plan as well. Um, working also on the tier two of complete streets. We're gonna make um, you know, multimodal and streets uh, more accessible and safe for all people and vehicle types and mobility. And um, so working on the master plan, which has been really amazing. Um, town meeting afforded us the opportunity to hire a consultant. We hired VHB, um, and they're actually an award-winning consultant as well for master planning, and they just hit the ground running. We just a few weeks ago completed our first public meeting with them. Uh, it was really incredible. It was a Zoom meeting, and it had live interactive polling, whereby you enter your answers, and you actually see the percentages and the word clouds um, you know, actually be activated on site. Uh, so that was really interesting. Uh, we're also working on um, the Mass Downtown Initiatives Grant, um, got $15,000 to help to provide Sterling with design guidelines for our town center. And we also just recently got awarded the EOEA Planning Assist Assistance Grant for 40000 So it's been a lot. It's been very busy. Well, it has been. And, you know, you used the term a second ago, hitting the ground running. And I remember that two years ago when you started, that was exactly how you started. So let's just back up a little bit. Sure. First of all, let's talk about the town planning process. So what is the status right now of the town plan? Um, in, town, in town planning, we're really, Sterling's always been considered the, the white spot in the center of the, the map of Massachusetts that never did any grants, never belonged to any kind of state programs where you get grant funding or anything like that. That's completely changed. Um, I, I've networked out so much, made contacts with people, attended numerous meetings, uh, applied for numerous grants, uh, just really trying to do much more for the town. Um, you know, right now, for example, our town center is a little bit tired. It has great bones, but you could tell that it's a little bit tired. So we're trying to do some um, grants to assist that. Again, these are all long-term plans. Um, so it, it's been it's been very very busy. And of course, you know we do get our, our planning applications, and I, I love meeting with developers and and attorneys and um, develop. I just it's it's just wonderful to see their design ideas and to be able to collaborate with them to some degree as well. Provide them with feedback and just get them through the uh, planning process. Now, are folks from the town, town residents, are they still able to participate in this town planning process? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so, for example, all of our boards and committees meetings, they're all available um, remotely for uh, participation. So, um, I can't speak for literally every board and commission, but I do know that I think probably the super majority are all doing Zoom. Um, and we do post the agendas, we do have the Zoom links, the passwords, the meeting IDs. 
Uh, and, and we do want people to participate because it, it still is an open process and we want to make sure that people understand that. Um, some boards and committees might choose to just operate by conference calls. But again, we're, we are open and accessible and, and it is business as usual, although it, in just different circumstances because of the pandemic. Now, I think that that's a really interesting point because on the one hand, we all got a notice a couple of uh, weeks ago or maybe a week ago that now the Buttrick building was once again closed down to the public and yeah. whatnot. So how do people find out about these meetings? So it's really easy. They can always call. Um, you know, our website is pretty robust and sophisticated that we have all of our information on their email as well. But we also, you know, we post the agendas. Um, the, the town's website actually does have a, a meeting agenda page and you can actually click on the, the date, find out what committee or board is meeting and, and it's hyperlinked to an, an agenda and you can see what all the topics are and what the um, Zoom information is. Um, and we also have posted on the doors as well, all of our contact information. We have doorbells as well that ring in case people need to drop anything off. We do encourage Dropbox as well. Uh, we get applications by PDF even. Um, so it, it, it really is business as usual, but in, again, in, the, in a different manner. Now, one of the things that I really remember is when you came on board, all of a sudden we were hearing about grants. We were hearing about all this. You, you just, you were so in tune with that. Um, how does that work? Um, and how do you look for these grants? How do you apply for them? So a lot of it is emails that come to us. We do get a lot of notifications and we also, planners actually do have a huge network system. Um, and so a lot of these um, state agencies also belong to this network system and they send email blasts all the time, constantly getting notices of, of grant opportunities, webinars for information on it, work sessions, um, and sometimes also through um, our regional planning commission too, they're also let us know about uh, grants that are out there and that are recently available. So it, it really is incredible, but there is a network built in to communicate to the towns and to the planners and um, you know the the information that there people are willing to talk to you to help you through the process. Um, it, it is out there. You just have to look for it. It's not too hard. One of the things with town planning, and of course planning of any sort, is there are of course the visible things. I mean, you suddenly have you know outdoor dining for a business, or you have some sort of a change in signage or whatever. But there are so many invisible things as well that people really don't see, but they are part of the infrastructure that really keeps a, a town going. What are some of those things that you can point to that have been going on? Well, one of them, for example, is one that I mentioned, like the uh, MVP plan, the Municipal Vulnerability uh, Preparedness Plan. That's something that you don't automatically see, but it's setting us up for the stage to actually do improvements so that Sterling is not um, in a compromised um, place due to climate change. So we'll be doing some, um, you know, further down the line, culvert replacements and, and things of that nature that actually are tangible. So we're actually, you know, we're doing a lot of the, the, the required plans that the grants stipulate as um, requirements in order to get money to actually do implementation. So this is like a lot of the things that we're doing. Um, even the update of our hazard mitigation plan, it's gonna expire in spring. And I, I you know, there would have been a gap in time between when we had opportunities to do it again. So we had to be proactive and. Um, our consultant that just did our MVP plan is actually going to undertake this plan for us. Um, we, we just don't want to leave Sterling in a vulnerable position in case, you know, a, a tragedy should happen. Um, you know, a hazard should come into play. So we're trying to be very proactive. And, and again, these are a lot of things that people don't see, um, but we're just laying the groundwork. This is a, these are long-term planning uh, efforts. Um, even some of the endeavors that I hope to do for the town center, I might never see them in my lifetime, but we're setting the stage for things to happen so that we will always have, you know, a quintessential New England town center in Sterling. Um, so, you know, 
sometimes the invisible stuff is the important stuff. And what impact, um, it sounds like a silly question to say, what impact has the pandemic had? But, you know, obviously when you're talking about planning and you'd like to calendarize things and, and whatnot, um, to what extent um, are you being slowed down or hampered by, by this? And how do you see that playing out? So the, the consultants as well as, you know, staff, are really trying to be extremely creative on how to outreach to the public for participation. Um, whether, for example, master planning, like doing surveys and, and you know, trying to get people to attend public meetings and, and things of that nature. You have to think a little bit outside the box. You know, so many email blasts, you know, just so many ways, press releases. How do we get the attention of people to participate remotely? And I understand that people really are kind of zoomed out and don't want to do this. And, and I get it because, you know, no offense, Lex, but I don't love Zoom all the time either. Sure. <laughs> Although I always love talking to you. Um, but you, you, it's, it's hard sometimes trying to draw people in for public participation. So we're finding that sometimes we're actually extending deadlines for results to come in, trying to solicit more participation. So it's a little bit of a, a bump, but what are you going to do? It's literally the, the best that we can do considering the pandemic and the tools that we have left to work with. Well, and I think the other thing too, and I think we, you know, keep thinking this and saying this to people is it's not just us or it's not just you or me. I mean, this is something that's affecting uh, everybody, you know, worldwide right now. And so now two years into, into the gig, um, what's in the future? What are you seeing as your most immediate, short and long-term plans? Well, again, trying to complete up these grants and then the most important part from that is the implementation of them. Um, you know, so for example, we're supposed to be finishing the master plan in one full calendar year's time, and then the real work starts. It's the implementation of the action items and the recommendations. Uh, it, I, I've always been a pro proponent to actually, um, you know, make things happen. Uh, my philosophy is never to have an accepted plan and put it on a shelf because it benefits nobody. So it, the, the, next, the next few years are going to be the important years of setting the stage and actually, you know, doing these implementations. Dominica, as always, it's a delight to speak with you. Um, I wish you and yours, everybody there at the Butterick Building, and of course you personally and your family, the very best through these very difficult times. That presentation is now over. We can hit stop share and it will bring us back to this. And that's how you share a presentation. On my bookshelf today is Pete the Cat, I Love My White Shoes. Pete the Cat is a fictional cartoon cat created by American artist James Dean. The series is made for young children. It started in 2008 with four books illustrated by Dean with the text by Eric Litwin. Since then, James Dean and his wife, Kimberly Dean, have written and illustrated the series of books. The first book, Pete the Cat, I Love My White Shoes, is a story of a cat whose white shoes get mucked up by various substances he steps in but Pete never loses his cool. The story is written as a song. Its refrain is, I love my white shoes, changing to, I love my red shoes, I love my blue shoes, and I love my brown shoes. Then he steps in a bucket of water and the colors wash off and they become wet, but still never loses his cool. He just sings his song. This particular book was self-published in 2008 and sold 7,000 copies in 10 months before it was picked up by HarperCollins, alerted by a YouTube meme in which two little girls read the book and distributed it throughout the United States and Canada. It rose to number eight on the New York Times bestseller list for picture books. Currently, this book is constantly read in my household, and I recommend it if you have children who love songs or like to sing to have it. <laughs> I, um, did you know that Sterling has six cemeteries and Lancaster has 10 cemeteries, six of which are public? The six public cemeteries in Lancaster include Old Settlers Burial Field. Old Settlers contain a little over 200 gravestones with the earliest identifiable death, rate, death date of 1674. 
Old Comet Cemetery, which has six Revolutionary War soldiers buried there. Bill Cemetery has about 500 gravestones and no less than 30 Revolutionary War soldiers are buried there. North Burial Ground has over 200 gravestones, including the three, including three Revolutionary War soldiers. North Village Cemetery not only has approximately 594 gravestones, but you can only still inquire, but you can still inquire to get a plot there. Eastwood Cemetery has the most gravestones with over 1,800. And in Sterling, there are six cemeteries in town, including Hillside Cemetery, Oak Hill Cemetery, Chocksit Cemetery, Cemetery, Leg Cemetery, Fairbanks Cemetery, and Cookshire Cemetery. That's a lot of cemeteries. And Scout Troop 189 has been going to these cemeteries to help restore and clean headstones of the graves. Um, we had Emmanuel go out the other day and film the interview that Kathy Harajian had with Eagle Scout Aiden Schneer about this project. So let's take a sneak peek. I'm Kathy Harajian from the Sterling Historical Commission, and we are here today with Aiden Schneer, Eagle Scout from Troop 189. He's completed a project restoring a section of the Chocsit or Reed Cemetery as it's known here in Sterling. It's a wonderful project that helped the community and also was an Eagle Scout project for Aiden. This is the most historically significant section of the cemetery. There are a lot of the town's founders buried out this way. Um, this grave specifically because it's the first settler and uh, this is one among many other graves uh, of different people and families that have similar significance to the town. And, it, and that brings up an important subject of restoration and the importance of this project. Um, do you feel that there could, what can, there is much more and what needs to be done to help this problem? Almost certainly. Um, we really only covered about half of what could be done in this section of the, of the entire cemetery alone. Uh, the rest of the old chocks at burial ground going all the way back there. Uh, it's, I don't know exactly how many acres it is, but it's quite large. Um, it could all be uh, worked on. I mean, just looking at this, you can see all the different stones that are completely misaligned. There are some that are leaning up on other stones. Um, Right. And over time, it just gets worse and worse and worse, and it destroys history. Right. And this is our American history that is so important, not just to Sterling, but to our whole nation. So it's really important to preserve it. It's so important to our remembering our history and not forgetting all the many people and what they all did and how that they are memorialized here. So. Well, it never would have gotten done without the rest of my troop. To see the entire episode, you can go to our website at slctv.us. And before we leave you today, we want to let you know that SLCT has started airing its holiday programs on Channel 8. Um, they're going to be playing all month long, so you can visit our website to also see our schedules. We hope that you found this episode helpful. If you have any questions on how to improve your videos, please feel free to contact us at slctnews at gmail.com. And we'll see you next time on Community Updates.